murders, mysteries, crimes. Well, that's all present in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the, Ar the Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. So today I'm going to be reading the first few pages of this book. And if you don't know who Sherlock Holmes is, he is a fictional character, but in his, in the books, he's a very good detective, and he's very popular. So, a scandal in Bohemia. To Sherlock Holmes, she is always the woman. I have seldom heard him mention her under any other name. In his highs, she eclipses and predominates the whole of her sex. It was not that he felt any emotion akin to love for Irene Adler. All emotions, and that one particularly, were abhorrent to his cold, precise, but admirably balanced mind. He was, I take it, the most perfect reasoning and observing machine that the world had seen. But as a lover, he would have placed himself in a false position. He never spoke of the softer passions, save with a gibe and a sneer. They were admirable things for the observer. Excellent for drawing the veil from men's motives and actions. But for the trained reasoner to admit such intrusions into his own delicate and finely adjusted temperament was to introduce a distracting factor which might throw doubt upon his mental results. Grit in a sensitive instrument or a crack in one of his own high power lenses would not be more disturbing than a strong emotion in a nature such as his. And yet there was but one woman to him and that woman was the late Irene Adler of dubious and questionable memory. I had seen little of Holmes since the singular chain of events which I had already narrated in a bold fashion under the heading, the sign of four, the four. My marriage had, as he foretold, drifted us away from each other. My complete happy, my own complete happiness and the home-centered interests which rise up around the man who finds, first finds himself master of his own establishment, were sufficient to absorb all my attention. While Holmes, who loathed every form of society with his whole bohem bohemian soul, remained in our lodgings in Baker Street, buried among his old books, and alternating from week to week between cocaine and ambition, the drowsiness of the drug, and the fierce energy of his own keen nature. He was still, as ever, deeply attracted from the study of crime and occupied his immense faculties and extraordinary powers of observation in following out to those clues and clearing up those mysteries which had been abandoned as hopeless by the official police. From time to time, I heard some vague account of his doings, the summons to Zdissa in the case of the Trepoff murder, or is clearing up in the singular tragedy of the Atkinson brothers in Trincomalee. I think. Trincomalee. Trincomalee. And finally, of the mission where he had accomplished so delicately and successfully for the reigning family of Holland. Beyond these signs of his activity, however, which I merely shared with all the readers of the Daily Press, I knew little of, little of my former friend and companion. One night, it was the 20th of March, 1888, I was returning from a journey to a patient, for I had now returned to the civil practice, when my way led me through Baker Street. As I passed the well-remembered door, which must always be associated in my mind with my wooing, with the dark incidents of the study in Scarlet. I was seized by a keen desire to see Holmes again and to know how he was employing his extraordinary powers. 
His rooms were brilliantly lit. And even as I looked up, I saw his tall, spare figure pass twice in a dark silhouette against the blind. He was pacing the room swiftly, eagerly, with his head sunk upon his chest and his hands clasped behind him. To me, who knew his every mood and habit, his attitude and manner told their own story. He was at work again. He had risen out of his drug-created dreams and was hot upon the scent of some new problem. I rang the bell and was shown up to the chamber, which had formerly been in part my own. His manner was not effusive. It seldom was, but he was glad, I think, to see me. With hardly a word spoken, but with a kindly eye, he waved to me in an armchair, threw across his case of cigars, and indicated a spirit case and gasogene in the corner. Then he stood before the fire and looked me over in a singular introspective fashion. Whitlock suits you, he remarked. I think, Watson, that you have put on seven and a half pounds since I saw you. Seven. Seven, I answered. Indeed, I should have thought a little more. She's a trifle more fancy, Watson. And in practice again, I observe, you did not tell me that you intended to go into harness. Then how do you know? I see it. I deduce it. How do I know that you have been getting yourself very wet, lady, lately, and that you have been most a most clumsy and careless servant girl? My dear Holmes, said I, this is too much. You would have certainly been burned had you lived a few centuries ago. It is true that I had been on a country walk on Thursday and came home in a dreadful mess, but as I had changed my clothes, and I can't imagine how you deduce it. As to Mary Jane, she is incorrigible, and my wife has given her notice. But there again, I fail to see how you work it out. He chuckled to himself and rubbed his long, nervous hands together. It is simplicity himself, said he. My eyes tell me that on the inside of your left shoe, just where the firelight strikes it, the leather is, the leather is scored by six almost parallel cuts. Obviously, they have been caused by someone who is very carelessly scraped around the edges of the sole in order to remove crusted mud from it. Hence, you see, my double deduction that you had been out in vile weather and you had a particularly malignant boots link specimen of the London slavey. As to your practice, if a gentleman walks into my room smelling of idof iodoform with the black mark of nitrate of silver upon his right forefinger and a bulge on the right side of his top hat to see that he is secreted in his stethoscope. I must be dull indeed. If I do not pronounce him to be an active member of the medical profession, I could not help laughing at the ease which he explained his process of deduction. When I hear your reasons, I remarked, the thing always appears to me so ridiculously simple that I could easily do it myself. Though at each successive instant of your reasoning, I am baffled until you explain your process. And yet, I believe that my eyes are as good as yours. If you like the book so far, by the Adventures of Sir Sherlock Holmes by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Um, and there's an Amazon link in the description, so check that out if you like the book. Um, beep, beep. Looks like I have my own mystery to solve.